and uh, we have our next distinguished speaker uh, who is well known in uh, smart grid and power area and uh, Dr. Anurag K. Srivatsava. And the talk is titled um, Building Cyber Physical Human Resiliency for the Power Grid. Dr. Anurag is a Raymond Lane, J. Lane Professor and Chairperson of Computer Science Electrical and Department at the West Virginia University. He is also an adjunct professor at the Washington State University and a senior scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Lab. He received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the Illinois Institute of Technology in 2005. His research interests include data-driven algorithms for power system operation and control, including cyber resiliency analysis. Dr. Srivatsava, uh, high-impact research project resulted in tools installed at the Utility Control Center, supported for more than $50 million by the U.S. Department of Energy, National Science Foundation, Siemens Corporate Research, Electric Power Research Institute, Schweitzer Engineering Lab, Power Systems Engineering Research Center, Office of Naval Research, and several national labs. Uh, indeed, Dr. Srivats, it's a great privilege to have you here. In the past years, it was working in, he has worked in different capacity at uh, Rezo D Transport, the Electricity in France, RWTH, Aachen University in Germany, Peak Reliability Coordinator, Aloha National Lab, PJM Interconnection, Schweizer Lab, GE Grid Solutions, MIT, and Mississippi State University. He has delivered 30 plus keynotes and tutorials, IEEE distinguished lectures in more than 15 countries. He is an IEEE fellow and the author of more than 300 technical publications, including a book on power system security and holds three patents. Uh, Dr. Anurag, it is my distinguished uh, privilege to introduce you now. I think you can share your screen and thank you for uh, being here during this uh, car symposium at the University of North Dakota. Hope you should be able to share your screen. Were you able to? Uh... Yeah, thank you. Let me let me share my screen. Thank, thanks so much. Okay, do you see my screen okay? Do you see my screen okay? Yes, we, can. we are good, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about something that I really like, which is power grid. And today we are not only going to focus on you know, physical part of the power grid, but also cyber, because that's what the theme is, and human operator, which is a very critical piece in, uh, you know, uh, in putting out power. Able to see the presenter view, uh, if you could swap screens, that would be perfect. Okay. Okay. Could you hit full screen, Dr. Anurag? Yeah. Yeah, is that better now? Do you see it? We can see your picture. We don't see the uh, slides. Okay. okay. Yeah, well, you can see. Can you hit uh, This is good, yeah. All right, okay. <laughs> I'm on two screens, so I just... Took out one screen out, so no, it will be better. Uh, so, so I'm going to talk about uh, human factor two, which is I think very important to protect power grid against cyber attacks. Uh, the work that I'm going to talk about is done over several years, and uh, you know, with with funding from DOE and NSF. So, so first thing is, you know, when we're talking about the power grid. This is where we, control center is the one place where we get all the data 
from the power grid coming in and that's where we make decision. Now, of course, there are some autonomous control or there are at least some, uh, you know, indirect control, which is at substation too. Uh, and the protection is one important, right? So protection is autonomous control uh, where the data is not coming to control center, but, but can be controlled from control center too. So most of the work uh, in terms of monitoring the grid is, is done here. And for cybersecurity also, you know, there will be another control center, which we typically call it network operation center. Uh, and, and that is mainly on IT security. The one thing that we are not doing in the power grid is integrated, you know, a set of data and, and making decision and detection and, uh, and taking some action for the power grid uh, to protect against cybersecurity. So one thing that I would like to you know, emphasize that why it is necessary and, and hopefully by end of uh, my talk, you, you know, uh, we can uh, pass this message from me to all of you that we need to integrate the power grid control security uh, control system with security, which we typically observe in network option center. And, and the data flow between these two uh, uh, even though we are going to get that in integrated manner, should be seamless. And and these operation, you know, is being basically is being done by uh, these operators, or should be familiar with that what, when they should take action, and when uh, cyber security engineers or or operators should take action, right? So that information should be uh, more seamless. Now, there's no doubt that you all, I mean, that's why we're doing a this conference even that cybersecurity is, is becoming more and more important uh, for the power grid because we are putting more and more digital control in the system. And, and since I would say like almost a decade, 10 years, the number of news that you get for the power out is possibly caused by cyber attack is, is, is a lot, right? I mean, uh, almost every month we hear uh, these kind of news. The first demonstrator attack was in Ukraine. Uh, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with that, 2015, 2016, and then one which just happened this year. So the question is that what we can do about it? Because right now the power grid control center, we are not bringing awareness about cyber security or cyber security detection. And, and the action that need to be taken we are not even training them, right? So first thing is we need to understand the problem of cyber attack or cyber events in the power grid is different than IT security. This is infrastructure security or power grid resiliency or cyber resiliency. This is different than what we typically do in IT security, right? The threat is different and the impact is different. Second thing that once we understand that we need to develop tools for uh, power grid operators and for cybersecurity operators in the power grid, you know, like working in the uh, same room or working in network of center. And these tools will be new because it does not exist right now. Third, we need to train these grid operators about uh, uh, these tools. And at the same time, we need to do some cognitive assessment of these power grid operators because uh, uh, we, we would want to present data in the best possible way so that they can make decision without being stressed because when the cyber attack is going on and, and they're not able to take some action because uh, you know their computers, I mean, that, that's what happened in, in uh, Ukraine attack, right? I mean, they were not able to do something from the control center. Of course, most probably it will not happen here because we do follow NOCSIP standards, but similar kind of uh, things can happen where operator are, are going to take some action, but they cannot because there is a denial of service attack going on uh, to, to even take action. So they have to find alternative, right? And all these things need to be done in, in a really short time, uh, faster than attackers. So for those training, for that kind of training, we definitely need some test bed, right? And, uh, and those test bed 
will not only help with training, but also with validation of those data before they uh, get trained in the real environment. So now, uh, you know, all these three things that I just talked about, I will, I'm going to go in more detail of each of these. Uh, so first one is understanding the problem in a little bit uh, differently because, because power grid cybersecurity is different than IT security, right? Now, to understand that better, let me talk about World War II, 1939, 1945, that happened. Um, if you look at this fighter jet with a lot of uh, bullet holes, and this is the one which is coming back from a war zone. So it survived, came back with these many bullets. Typically, if you look at that, then you'll see that this is where the vulnerability is. This is where we are getting hit. So let's make it stronger, right? So you reinforce it. And then you say that, you know, uh, we did something to avoid vulnerabilities. I mean, this is how typically IT works. Now, if you think about it more broadly, these are the fighter jet which is coming back. The other one which is not coming back is probably getting hit at that part where there is no bullet holes. And those are the part which we should be reinforcing more, right? So the difference is one is vulnerability based on the data that we can collect. And the second one is system survivability. These are different thinking. One is system thinking. One is, you know, host or component thinking uh, and, and thinking in terms of vulnerabilities. So, and, and at that time also, it was pointed out. Uh, in fact, this is how the our brain works. It is called cognitive bias. And uh, at that time, Abraham Wald was the one who pointed out this uh, and, and pointing to the system vulnerability or system survivability. And, you know, he did, was able to convince that where to reinforce uh, the system. Now, of course, several decades later, when we think about cyber power electric grid, we have to think in the same way. It's about cyber is only supporting the power grid. The ultimate goal is to supply the power. And uh, if we call that as a power grid survivability against cyber attack, then survivability will be measured in terms of that how many or how much critical load we can provide the power, right? Now, this is different, uh, of course, in the power grid, it, there are many more layers uh, in, in terms of component and then all the process and protocol that is running to bring the data to, you know, used by some functions. And all of these are being done with uh, some business objective with some regulatory framework, right? If you look at that, then you can apply the same uh, logic that we can find the vulnerabilities. And we are, you know, at the component level, there are a bunch of vulnerability that has been discovered, which we call cyber vulnerability exposure, CVE. And we typically focus on, you know, patching it and then saying that, you know, we have solved the problem, even though we have not patched all. Uh, but, but the thing is that we need to do a better job of ranking those components and how it is going to relate to a cyber resiliency metric which is ability of the system to keep supplying critical load, even with certain cyber vulnerability exploited, right? So that's a system level. Uh, uh, we all understand that's very tough to, very challenging to figure it out, but that's where we need to go so that we can rank these, and there are millions of devices out there which has still CV. We need to get out there and uh, rank those and only fix, first fix those which has more impact on the system compared to others, right? Now, uh, so that's the system thinking, understanding the problem. And, and then we all know that there are millions of vulnerabilities which still exist because it has not been passed. And we also know that there are attacks going on and, and we are surviving it because attacker is not going all the way to harming the grid, right? So, so we are surviving not because of uh, we are protecting it in a right way, but you know, because attacker probably knows that if they go 
all the way and impact the grid, then there will be crime and cyber crime uh, against them. Uh, in other country, it is being compromised, it is being uh, impacted. Now, going into more uh, in a process that, that how the cyber attack will impact uh, all the way till the, the target get uh, impacted, uh, let me, uh, you know, pull up this example for uh, which was done by one of my past student. So hopefully you can still see the. So so before that, uh, let me show you, uh, you know, the other attack which is which is increasing, and and I'm sure that you are all very much familiar with that. So this one is FireEye map, which is showing the attack happening, or at least suspected attack happening right now, right? So it is to, you know, 130 there. And uh, and these are the attack that is happening right now from one country to another one. Uh, these are only based on data packets uh, and suspicion. You know, it has not been validated that uh, it is a real cyber attack and, and what is the intention. But this is happening, you know, almost, uh, every few seconds, right? Now, let me get to this part and, and show you something that, that one of my student has worked on in the past. So first thing, what we will look at is, uh, uh, you know, how many devices in the power grid is open uh, and, and which is, you can look at at shodan.io. Um, so, so this is what uh, is going to be uh, uh, we were looking at very soon, but but these kind of you know real time attack you cannot only look at the fire eye but several different uh, uh, you know like the Kaspersky lab you can look at that too for all the attacks that's going on right now right how many of them is uh, can be launched against the power grid is uh, uh, first we'll look at IO. Uh, shodan.io and uh, that will give me a group of devices which has open port and uh, you know can be utilized by uh, basically attack right so if you go to shodan.io and this is done uh, you know a couple of years before when it was before graduation of student but here we can search for internet of things uh, and it doesn't matter that where those devices are connected even in the power grid which typically should not be on the internet, it should be on intranet, uh, which, which is inaccessible. But we all know that these devices are connected on internet so that it can get engineering access and it can be, uh, you know, uh, basically either upgraded or uh, updated for, for certain things. So there are a lot of devices, which as this one shows, uh, which is connected to the internet. And, uh, from there, if we click on that, we can get a lot of more information, that IP device address, uh, port of communication, and, and you know, what, what is, uh, what are the different ports open? So, so there's a lot of information basically out there, right? Now, typically, if we want to, so this is similar to Ukraine attack, the, the black one is attacker, white one was a defender or basically imply. And if you think about that, that's where the, uh, you know, most of the attack happens that attacker will send an email to thousands of employees and, uh, and thus brings another factor, which is human factor. And, and then uh, employee, which is a white screen, will get that email uh, and, and the email will be very nice that saying that this is your employee review or, or something like that. And, uh, and, and we imply will open that. Again, this is something exactly similar to what happened in uh, Ukraine attack and click on the attachment and that's where the malware gets installed and to the imply computer. Then imply has access to OT and uh, you know, we, the, the attacker will keep recording all their access and, and the password and everything uh, over a few months, and 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 then they can they're ready to launch the attack uh, by slowly moving into the 
uh, with each access that employee will do by slowly moving it to the other set of devices where they can uh, impact uh, you know from ot side to to the power grid so this is how it's, it's making its way into the you know corporate network and then finally from there to uh, substation process control network uh, if we can detect it before that then of course we can save the system but we typically put uh, i mean if there is any intrusion detection we will put either on the it side or on the you know deep ot side so this whole process we typically do not map uh, which is of course necessary and you know to protect the system so it is very quick overview and then once they are an ot network then they can they can have the full control just like engineers will do or operator will do and opening the breakers uh, intensely which should not be open and causing the you know basically impacting the grid and and causing the power outages let me stop and go back to uh, slide so this is what we just discussed about that was actually a 2015 ukraine attack now if you think about all the attack that is happening now 95 percent of successful cyber attack are started with a human right so training of the human uh, employee is, is very very necessary now we talked about vulnerabilities cve is example of that cyber vulnerability exposures uh, what we are more interested in is risk so risk is where the threat times vulnerability times impact and i know we don't have a good way to measure the impact uh, because we do not have a complete cyber physical model of our system right but that's that's need to be done um, you know have a metric which can give you impact vulnerabilities are known and then threat are also known we already talked about this and now how do attackers attack so this is one framework mitre framework uh, which which typically helps uh, to analyze uh, you know uh, when we are going to think about that how how to protect against a specific attack right so so i really like this meta framework they keep updating uh, their framework and uh, it's very comprehensive okay so first thing was power grid security is different than it security and it need to be done at the system survivability and and knowing that our grid itself resiliency is is about keep supplying the power even with the cyber attack and and that's what the focus should be right now to enable that we do need tools first to measure the impact which we call like let's say cyber resiliency metric and the second we need a tool to detect things classify it and then find the root cause so that it can help the operator to take a right control action and it does not need to be only in the you know the using the data from only cyber data but we can also use the physical data in enabling that right so let's talk a little bit more about that so so again uh, we are talking about information security which we typically do which is it infrastructure security is a little bit different then application security which is running in the power grid all the function uh, vendors that has to be uh, made secure and then physical security so this cyber security framework is is uh, you know already said that identifying protection protect detect respond recover framework should typically work of course it does not tell you that how to do that what tools are needed right so from identifying we of course can use some of the existing one like network scanner vulnerability scanner network sniffer for protection we already do some it based protection authentication encryption access control it can be more rigid uh, while still keeping the services in mind that need to be uh, still entertained in the power grid and then detection uh, is of course intrusion detection with both set of data that we are going to talk a little bit more about and then respond this in support tool and then how do we recover 
right? So in terms of detect, you know, we do have a lot of data and, and now the data stream that we are getting is increasing more and more. So we get data from PMUs, which is more faster than we get CT, PT, we get precursor status. We can configure even relay to, to stream your data uh, on demand or, or send you something if something happens, right? We can set up that uh, uh, mechanism into different digital devices. And then we get cyber data, which is of course network data, network traffic, uh, you know, hosts uh, from different event logs. And all of these need to be used uh, to first detect that there is an anomaly because in the first step, we cannot know that it's a cyber attack or not. We can only suspect that, right? So, and, and let's say sensor fail, that also is anomaly. So first is anomaly detection. And then only we have to classify it into a cyber attack or what kind of event it is. Uh, but before we do that, we need to generate alarm and uh, send, which, which is again, there's a typical practice right now. If something is off by a certain threshold, then we say that this is anomaly. And we send the alarm uh, in, even in a physical power grid operation center. We need to classify that. And then uh, uh, out of that, the, there will be a bad data. There will be a sensor problem. Uh, and there will be some event, either cyber event or physical event. So we need to classify that uh, and then localize it, that where it is happening. Then we need to rank them. And ranking is here is, I think is, you know, see in different color because uh, I think a lot of work need to be done in that. Um, with millions of devices in the field, ranking of those anomalies that we see in real time and vulnerability ranking, uh, which is not have been exploited, both need to be done uh, you know, in, in future, and, and that requires a lot of efforts. And then uh, root cause diagnosis and uh, prognosis uh, will be the next step because we need to fix the problem. We need to know exactly what is happening. And then finally, it results into decision support, right? So we have applied a lot of different technique for anomaly detection after we get this data, you know, uh, from exactly that what we just talked about uh, from physical system data and from cyber data system. This one is showing only physical data and only PMUs, even though you can apply to SCADA and other set of data. And after applying uh, different technique, like this one is discussing about Chebyshev integration and clustering, DB scan, what we typically find that one technique does not work, right? So there's no single technique which is giving going to give you results. And, and you can only validate either by manual analysis or by generating this data and having anomaly similar to the real system, right? All of these needs a lot of tuning effort. Um, and again, we don't have training data for machine learning approaches. So uh, after trying multiple different techniques, you know, Chebyshev regression, DB scan, random forest, failure theory, uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, LSTM, autoencoder, graph-based correlation neural network, and even considering concept drift. We, we have published series of papers, but the, the final, you know, finding is that none of these is uh, going to give you perfect result. And then we thought maybe we can combine or integrate these things uh, with certain multi credit decision making process. So we develop this ensemble based technique, which can come integrate the result from multiple. And in that way, at least you'll get the result, which is better than each of these, right? Again, the computational cost is going down. And as long as we keep it to unsupervised method or semi-supervised and, you know, the statistics based approaches, uh, computation cost still low, even by integrating multiple different techniques. And then uh, you will, uh, the next step will be classification that once we see something, then what is outlier, what is missing data, what is event data, and that requires more work. So the bad data detection and the event detection is the same part that we just talked about. And, and then you can uh, look at physics-based characteristic graph from the power grid network and, and can develop some theoretical approaches, which will help in terms of classification. So I'm not going to go in detail of these, but we basically start from the stream of data and the final result it is going to give us that this is a cyber attack or this is a fault 
or uh, you know tripping of generator we can get that right uh, from this theoretical approaches now once we got that approaches then we also need to know about sensor uh, so for example pdc which is a failure data concentrator uh, if that is compromised or if that has anomaly or event or the sensor which is another you know like pmu has a problem so we can further extend it and and look at uh, more cyber layer and different component in that cyber layer so we we, we basically in the test bed, we added a lot of these different layer of anomaly inspired by real systems. And uh, we developed series of tools. So one is SciADC, you know, synchrophaser anomaly detection and classification. And, you know, we, we, we are basically close to 95% in terms of accuracy, which can be further improved. Now, so, so that's part of detection and classification, right? And the next part is a metric that we talked about that how do we know that which vulnerability if exploited is going to impact the system more? So which is cyber resiliency metric. And to measure it, if you think about uh, with the same goal and the goal is ability of system to keep supplying power to critical load with the complete cyber network system and complete physical system, so these two network is definitely going to impact that resiliency metric, right? Control is going to imp impact that. Uh, and, and then we integrate all these things together and we develop multiple different tools. Uh, you know, one is Canvas, which we are looking at the videos that was for Canvas uh, tool. Cypher is for cyber physical resiliency in microgrid. CPSAM is cyber physical security assessment metric for distribution system. And then CPTRAM is cyber physical transmission resiliency metric, which I'm going to a little bit talk more about. Uh, and each of these is, is going to give us metric, which we can use to weigh against that, which one to focus more. And if you have a three different decision making process or option, which one to take first, right? So uh, we collect these physical factors from the power grid and we combine that using an article process, which is one of the multi-carry decision-making process. And then we collect from cyber factors, which is network reconfiguration, redundancy in the communication network, uh, latency, and, and in a lot of different factors, uh, which is not comprehensive list here. But, but the goal is that again, with the same goal, ability of system to supply critical load and what will impact. And as long as we collect those factors and, and integrate that, we get these metrics, which is physical resiliency and cyber resiliency. If you want, we can integrate it, but uh, typically there's no need because we still want to backtrack. And if we see something going on wrong, then we want to fix that problem. So we can uh, you know, backtrack from the cyber physical resiliency metric all the way to physical system and to factors and then and those factors to the real system and fix that problem. Same thing for cyber attack we can go backtrack from cyber resiliency and those factors and, and mapping to the real system in cyber network and, and figure out exactly that what happened and where it happened, right? So this is advantage of this uh, factor-based and criteria-based system thinking for resiliency metrics. Again, we can uh, convert that with some formula to, to get a single matrix, right? Uh, uh, but the advantage is now I am ready to compare different kind of security mechanisms that I can implement in the system. And, and in, within our budget, we can find out that which one will be best possible uh, in terms of economic and in terms of security, right? So here you see SM1, SM2, SM3, like let's say these are the different criteria for security. And then we can choose between low, medium, and high. Of course, we can have more uh, classes here. Uh, and what will we choose? Now we do have a metrics to, to find out that how the metric is going to change against us. So this is a very simple example, even though the same thing can be applied to a larger system and we have, we have applied to larger system. And uh, the, the last row is going to give me a you know, physical resiliency metrics and we can also get the cyber resiliency metrics and we can compare right from here. Now, the third thing is uh, test bed. So we take these tools and compare, uh, validate uh, with different, multiple different scenarios, and also use that for training, 
right uh, of operators so this test bed could be different kind it could be electromagnetic uh, you know like which is rtds based uh, real time simulator with r in the loop it could be electromagnetic simulator which is more scalable because uh, rtds you uh, you know depending on that how much uh, you can invest your size uh, of uh, power grid is limited uh, by the racks in electromechanical simulator you know most probably the computing need will not be so high so you can use that uh, with multiple computer and and really, really large system thousands of loss you know buses system can be simulated so this one we we develop uh, here with open dss mainnet which is for distribution system for test view two and rtds uh, you know you can you can do both distribution and power system and here if you can replace open dss with you know, other like mat power or uh, you know, power world, we can do the transmission system electromagnetic simulation too. These are all integrated cyber physical systems with uh, human involved, right? So cyber physical human test bed, uh, uh, this is uh, right now is based on RTDS and we do have a reduced system of Washington state in this uh, working with another company. Uh, and then you see multiple hardware in the loop. So so the data generated is elastic. We have also software defined network, uh, you know, devices from SEL integrated into this. And then we have a substation HMI, then we have NS3, with, uh, which is like a network, cyber network repre representation. And then we also have a control center with, uh, you know, multiple different software like PingTink for collecting the PMU data, uh, Splunk for cyber logging and cyber monitoring system. We do have uh, Inksys Power Simulator for Power Grid EMS, uh, and, and then we also have Resilient Grid software, which is uh, uh, you know for visualization in terms of human factor in mind. So several different software integrated together uh, with more than you know ten industry members working with. Uh, but the advantage is now it's end to end physical system with real hardware. Uh, with a uh, cyber network model with control devices and uh, all the way to uh, two control center. One is uh, power grid control center in the lab and also network operation center in the lab, right? Uh, and then we can simulate multiple different case scenarios and see that how our tool is going to work, how uh, our monitoring is working, how uh, operator can respond to this, and, and then uh, how to use cyber information. So this is from Splunk you know, uh, that the kind of report we can get uh, for the cyber logging data. But what is more interesting is this human operator. We can, we also have device for a skin response where we can see that how they are going to, how much stress they are. Uh, and, and then we also have another one uh, for eye tracking, which can do the gaze mapping and heat maps and uh, editor, right? So, so this is how, uh, when the operator is responding to a simulated cyber attack and simulated system, they, they have to put these glasses out so we can track that, which information they are looking at. And that will something look like this. So, so there are six, let's say monitor in front of them. Everything that you see more highlighted uh, is, is that's where they were looking more and more, right? And we can exactly look at each screen where they're looking. So we know that what information to present for the best decision possible in the shortest time, right? Because that's what the our goal is. So I'll just show you a very quick, uh, you know, kind of uh, simulation we did uh, uh, for simulating Ukraine attack with this test bed. Uh, so, you know, the email goes out and then that's how they make it into the IT to OT. And then once in OT, then uh, they're able to, observe the different kind of protocol which is in place uh, and uh, and then use that for uh, sending a command which will uh, go all the way to switch level. Again, this is simulated part once we get to the power grid part. Well, other are real devices. And then uh, we can show that, you know, this whole process at least using some part real and some part simulated and some part emulated. Uh, but the, what we get as a result is very important because it, and again, this is not showing the complete steps, but it is showing some of the steps. What we want to show here is if we can detect early enough, 
we always have a chance to increase the resiliency. So what you see here, which is going down, is cyber physical resiliency. And, uh, and, and very simplistic way, it is showing that without metrics and without measuring it, of course, it will resiliency will go down and uh, you'll see the impact, right? With the control action, either from cyber or physical, which you do have chance of taking it multiple different times uh, with different steps, we can take a action and save the system, right? So just to summarize, uh, you know, electric grid cybersecurity has to consider uh, not only cyber system, but also physical system that is underlying and which we are going to use to supply the power and, and especially critical load under extreme events. And also human, uh, because they are the one who are making a decision and they will, and it's gonna stay. We are not going to do automatic control because if you do more, that more and more often, in fact, we are making our grid more cyber vulnerable, right? So human operator will be kind of like a human firewall who are there to protect this grid, but they need to be trained. And we need a lot of new tools, which does not exist right now, um, because we have not seen any real cyber event which is impacting the grid. And, and that's why we are still not integrating these tools, even though research has taken over and a lot of research is going on to develop those tools. And test beds are very important for decision-making and training those operators. So I'll stop here and I'll be very happy to, you know, take some question, but uh, I just want to part, you know, point out this cartoon that this one shows that there's a big difference between power grid engineers and uh, cyber experts. And they do not understand each other. They need to work more and more together. And, you know, of course, university okay. will help, it will, will help to do that. Great. Uh, that's a nice ending cartoon. Thank you, Dr. Aradak, for uh, your time. But I think uh, let's have some questions. I think, uh, you know, it's great that you brought, uh, you know, you talked about physical cyber and the human factors, right? You had a metric in the past, uh, CP tram, and then you talked about this human test spread. You know, what is your uh, experience when talking to these utilities in terms of uh, how do they perceive from a system operator point of view, how invasive to take these uh, skin as other types of bio kind of thing? Does it, you know, I'm just curious to see how the operators may feel about sharing those invasive parameters that, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know, I'm just curious to see, uh, that probably have to have an IRB approval for research study, or maybe, I don't know. I'm just curious. To yeah, see what yeah, so we do have IRB approval and when we bring operators in our lab to for the simulator environment, we they need to sign and they need to agree on that. But I did spend some time in the control room with, with the grid operators and with the tool team. And I think when they are working, they do they probably will not like to have those uh, measures. But in training, they can. You know, because training they have to they, they are being monitored anyway. You know, someone is the supervisor is there, which is looking at that, what action they are taking, everything is getting recorded. Uh, so if we record these things that which part of the screen they're looking at, uh, and, and we tell them that this is going to help, I think in training, it should not be a problem. Especially when you showed that slide, 95% of the cyber attack is due to human error. Exactly. So maybe we need to focus more towards that dimension and see what is a human resiliency metric may look like? You know, how can we able to coin that definition that may require, you know, a combination of those uh, who need to be fine for factors. Anyway, it was interesting uh, 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 discussion. But uh, we have some couple of questions. I think I see that. Uh, how do we quantify impact and threat for risk calculation? Are there any standards or tools available? No. Yeah, so I'm not aware of any standards, uh, you know, for measuring the impact. There are CVE-based, uh, you know, some metric, which which actually, I would say that probably we were the first to, to come up with those. Uh, that was almost eight years before. And and then there are some metric that we just, I just talked about, which is CPSAM and, uh, uh, you know, Canvas and CPTRAM. I, I think that it's directly because it is system driven metrics. 
it is giving us metric for impact uh, in terms of cybersecurity, different kinds of cybersecurity attacks that can happen. Now, uh, I'm sure that there are other, uh, and I have seen that uh, in research that you know uh, there are several different groups who are working on this. Uh, but I'm not familiar with any standard which has uh, been implemented other than NUCSIP, which does not have a metric to measure the impact. Great. Um, there's one more question. From your experience, how an attacker can understand the electric grid by looking at data without knowing the overview of the system? It may be interpretable for an IT system, but not the same for a power grid. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So, you know, we talked about um, the you talked about the topological and uh, some other uh, functional hierarchical layers. So, how yeah. do you? That, that's that? very important question. I think outsider attacker will not be able to cause the big impact because they do not have access to information. So we we had uh, you know one of my students has done this uh, thesis um, I think like six years before where we looked at varying set of information which is publicly available and how it is going to help uh, attacker to understand the grid better. And, and what was surprising is that you can actually get planning network model uh, in publicly available for different kind of power grid network. And using graph theory, you can actually figure out uh, that which one is going to cause more impact if taken out. Or even you can figure out that what is the combination of different line going out, uh, just looking at voltage level, you can use the typical resistance and in, you know, inductance uh, for the, those lines. Uh, of course, it will not be accurate as uh, we do in mass one security analysis in the power grid with complete set of data and with the operation data, but it will be much better than uh, doing the random attack. So attacker can get a lot of publicly available information, uh, you know, uh, which is not good, but, but they can do with uh, some set of norms which is available out. Good. There is another question. Um, you mentioned that uh, I think it looks like 4,000 attacks on PJM's um, network every day, you know, so uh, do you have any idea these are insider threats or external threats or, uh, you know, uh, what do you see? What do you hear from uh, utilities on uh, these type of threats? Yeah, so these are all external and, uh, and a lot of those are actually caught in IT. So these are all IT side. Uh, uh, some makes it, and that's why I said that we are still protected and, and not seeing in the U.S. Uh, a big impact uh, on the grid. Uh, not that we are protecting it very right way, but because we are just getting lucky that attacker does not want to take next step and, and it's not a status sponsored because they know the consequences. I mean, this will be a cyber crime and what will happen next, uh, they probably know it. So, so uh, but in terms of vulnerability and in terms of risk that still exist, right? So, so they are just, attacker are probably only demonstrating that we can get into the system. We can, uh, we can try to get somewhere and, and still exposed, right? So, and, and, and these are going, these have increased. In fact, that, that number that we just talked about is, is a little bit older, uh, but every tool is seeing that. One final question, you know, we know that NIST has a cybersecurity framework, you know, um, how are utilities are compliant to these NIST uh, minimum set of rules that they probably have to comply with? Are they adequate enough to, you know, to make sure we have safeguards that is there in place for in the event of any major attacks, like, you know, doesn't happen like what we saw in Ukraine. So how do you see from the compliance point of view, of course, one of the metrics, what you talked about is all risk assessment in terms of uh, metrics and resiliency, you know, and uh, um, of course the standards needs to agree to certain resiliency metric, but also once we come into the compliance aspect of it, you know, how do we, how do you, your interaction with it is on the compliance perspective? Yeah, well, NIST has a lot of uh, good framework and uh, but those are still guidelines. Those are still, uh, uh, you know, so not something for utility to follow uh, necessarily, right? So, so they some are following and some are not. But NERC 
Nakhsip is, is something that they have to follow. And I would say that because of Nakhsip, something like Ukraine will not happen here. So it is protecting, you know, in a, in, as a first measure. But definitely it's not adequate. There, there are more need to be done, but each comes with a heavy cost to the utility. So, you know, we have to just find that balance that uh, how, and these are utilities are regulated, right? So they cannot, uh, they, they have to, I mean, there are real challenges that how they collect enough revenue to implement those, uh, which is more adequate and, and more powerful uh, cyber security measures uh, compared to what we are doing now within NERCSEP. At the same time, uh, you know, keeping the cost low, which is approved by regulators. Uh, yeah, so there has to be more work done, but, but definitely it's not adequate, but adequate enough that we are protected as, uh, you know, as a first layer, I would say. Thank you so much, Dr. Anurag, for your time today. It's a great honor to have you for our CAR symposium. Uh, thank you for agreeing to my invite, you know, and uh, we'll be sending you our nice flag, recognizing your contribution. Uh, you know, uh, so we'll be, uh, send, please send us your mailing address so we can able to mail that. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.